Other than the fact that Porky Pig is objectively the sexiest Looney Tune, My milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. there is absolutely no reason that Porky Goddamn Pig needed a video game. But also, it was the mid-90s, and colorful 2D platformers with cartoonish mascots were kind of a thing. The Looney Tunes are some of the only animated characters who even come close to rivaling Disney in terms of brand recognition. I was never a religious viewer of the Looney Tunes, but I've definitely seen all the classics, and these cartoons gave us so many iconic characters, like Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Wile E. Coyote, and Michael Jordan. There's a lot to draw from for a game here, so on paper, even a game based on Porky Pig, everyone's favorite Looney Tune, it has potential. Like I mentioned earlier, 2D platformers were probably the most popular type of game back in the 90s, almost to the point where people were getting sick of them. And with that said, if you've played even a single platformer from 20 years ago that wasn't Mario or Sonic, you've probably played a game that plays at least a little bit like this. It's floaty, not overly responsive, and the hit detection is pretty hard to predict because the sprites are big and clumsy. The background sometimes blends in a bit too well with the foreground, making it hard to tell what's a platform and what's just scenery. Porky himself is a bit sluggish, and I often find myself jumping in a weird loop shape so I can be sure I land on top of the enemy because the sprite is just so wide. Jumping on enemies is always a weirdly disappointing action since I always expect to be able to bounce off them higher than I actually do. Even though the game doesn't control satisfyingly at all, at least the game's physics are consistent. Consistency at least means that I can get used to them. You can take up to four hits, collect desserts to earn points and extra lives, and you beat the game by traversing six different themed stages, each with a boss at the end. With that out of the way, we can finally talk about the things that make this game stand out for better or for worse. We begin the game with a rather standard cutscene showing Porky Big falling asleep while planning his holiday vacation. Or as you can see, his haunted, his, his haunted haunted holiday vacation. We're off to a great start. So yeah, the game actually takes place completely in a dream and it's upfront about it. I'm down for that. It's like the game telling you there will be no restrictions to what it will throw at you. Dream levels are almost always awesome. So an entire dream game has to be pretty cool, right? But this isn't just any dream. This is a nightmare. So it's a spooky scary game, and what better way to start the game than with a spooky scary forest. And honestly, this is actually kinda creepy. Those trees in the background aren't exactly the most welcoming of sights, and these spikes are everywhere. And oh my god, listen to that music. This isn't first level music. And to top it all off, we come face to face with the most iconic of Porky Pig's terrifying adversaries. Green shoes. It's a fairly standard level, with an interesting spiderweb section and a fairly impressive 3D part with this rotating tree. My biggest complaint with this level, and about half the other levels, is how it's almost like a maze in some sections, meaning you could end up going in the complete wrong direction. And yet other times the game is just like, Jesus, just go this way, goddammit. There's also a weird section with this power-up that makes Porky trip balls for a little bit so we can fly. This is the only time this happens. We end the level with a boss fight against a ghost, and at this point you now know how to beat four out of the five remaining bosses as well. Wait until they change their facial expression and jump on their head. So on our epic journey to reach the final boss, we he lives next door to the final boss. Oh my god. You know, Porky, for someone who has enough self-confidence to walk around wearing no pants, you sure have a big problem confronting your neighbors. Level 2 has a Wild West theme, and it's decidedly less creepy than the last level. Honestly, this is some pretty by-the-book stuff. Jump on rooftops, avoid trains, etc. Later, there's this part where you have to navigate a hotel by going through sets of doors and avoiding- No, 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 we're gone, I'm leaving, I'm gone. Yosemite Sam's boss fight is ridiculously easy. You stand right here and wait until his bullets pass by, and then immediately jump on this lever. Excellent, I love it. Continuing on, we have Atlantis, where everything is slightly slower and your jumps are overall lower. To be fair, this is actually a pretty neat stage. You go from riding a raft above water to sinking and exploring a sunken ship, and then you end up in Atlantis, followed up by a boss fight with a circus? Shark? You have these yellow and green animals that you can jump on to create bubbles for you to ride on, and some pretty neat sections that have you jumping back and forth between two bubbles to avoid spikes. Level 4 is the mines, which is by far my least favorite stage. You spend a lot of time wandering around mine shafts that all look the same, and often you're going to end up having a boulder fall on you because you took the wrong path. A lot of cheap deaths happen because the level layout is just too cramped for how big they made Porky. Yet despite all this, the boss fight is somehow the easiest. Level 5 is the point where you realize the designers were kind of phoning it in. Back to back mountain levels? And a snow world at that? Beyond these guys being terrifying, the only interesting thing about this level is the brief ski lift section, and because the rest of the level is just more generic snow- Oh my god, that what is- Oh my god, it's fucking raining cats and dogs. Like it literally is, not just the expression. I didn't think I'd get to use it like this. What am I even looking at? This came out of nowhere. Did the designers just go crazy halfway through making this game? Because everything is so abstract and, come to think of it, actually dreamlike. Honestly, the rest of the game doesn't even feel like a dream. This feels like I'm playing someone's nervous breakdown. Oh, you know, just your standard solar system made up of billiard balls and chicken drumsticks. Excuse me? Fucking excuse me! I want to meet the person whose job it was to draw that egg hanging on the clothesline. Because I can only assume that person has stories to tell. 
Everything plays the same, but now you're riding carrots, getting scared by horse faces, and questioning why you're still playing this game. There's this one specific part where you have to go through a bunch of doors and do some small platforming sections until you get to the last set where you have to fall through the air into some more doors. Except if you choose the wrong door, which you will, you'll have to redo all six doors you just went through over and over until you get it right. I have two theories for how this stage got made. A, someone actually had a nervous breakdown and convinced people that this was the best direction to take the game in. Or B, this is actually a harsh artistic commentary on the video game industry at the time, criticizing the overabundance of cartoonish platformers that just threw a bunch of colorful platforms and characters together and shipped it out without anyone actually caring about the artistic integrity of the product they put out. And this level is a representation of all those games, seemingly random assets thrown together in a confusing mess of platforms and level design. Or you know, someone was bored, but that's less exciting. But then we cut back at random to more snow and then bam, a boss fight against a yeti and we're done the level. That entire weird section is never addressed or explained. I love it so much. And finally, we reach the place we've been trying to get to all along, the castle. This section is actually pretty well done in terms of theming, beginning with an imposing march through a creepy garden, most of which can be bypassed by taking a cloud shortcut, and then he has to explore the trap-filled halls of a haunted castle. And now all I have left is the final showdown against a- uh, damn it. And now all I have left is the final showdown against damn it. Final showdown against damn it. And now all I have- god damn it. And now- mm. Okay, sorry, just give me one second, I have to beat this one part- OH MY GOD! That's it! I'm done! I did my best to avoid mentioning it, but this game is fucking bullshit sometimes. See this ball and chain obstacle? How do you get past it? I don't know! Porky is way too big to fit under or over it, and the ball will just stop in reverse direction at random. Hey, that's cool, it's a well. Maybe I can explore it. And if you go down it, you have a mini game where you have to collect cupcakes, and I'm dead now. Oh, but don't worry. The game had an arrow telling me to move at the last possible second, so when you think about it, this is really all my fault. Okay, you gotta be kidding me. I know the boulder is gonna fall. I'm not dumb. Yet, it refuses to trigger. So I'm just gonna walk back and forth for a while while trying to trigger it, but inevitably get crushed by it because the controls aren't precise enough for this type of challenge. And these things! I have never hated an enemy that lacked any sort of personifying characteristic so much. It's a stick of dynamite with wings. Just look at its attack pattern. Dive bomb the player every time they jump? Well, fine, I'll just duck. Well, I'm out of ideas then. I'm just gonna avoid these enemies at all costs because I need to conserve health. And here I go, I fell. This isn't the first time the game has pulled this on me too. There are tons of times where I've fallen and instead of killing me, the game has me land on an earlier part of the stage. This is more of a genre-wide problem than it is specific to this game. If it takes less time for a player to kill themselves to get back to where they were, than it does to get back there manually, then there is no reason to put these ridiculous trap doors in. If it's an open world game, sure, because if I fall and get frustrated, I always have the option of coming back to this part later. But in a strictly linear game, I'm 100% of the time just gonna go kill myself to reset the checkpoint. It's not like this game even penalizes me for it either, because you have infinite continues from every checkpoint. Which of course makes exploring the optional rooms all the more pointless, since any bonus rooms you find just gives you extra lives and points. And let's face it, you're not going to be impressing your date with your Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday high score. After the unreasonable difficulty of the castle sections, the final boss is disappointingly easy, and not impressive in the least. Daffy Duck is a vampire, but he's not actually the boss. This robot is. But you have to jump on Daffy first to be able to hit the robot, but since I can do this, it's not challenging at all. I don't know, I was expecting a bit more before the credits rolled. I'm glad you're at least proud of yourself, Joe. Great job on the script, by the way. Top-notch writing. The game deserves a little bit more credit, though, as the graphics are pretty respectable. I can tell what each piece of art is supposed to be. There are lots of little details, like statues of other Looney Tunes in the background of Atlantis. Porky has his little facial fidget programmed into his idle animation, and there's actually a pretty big selection of enemies and locations. But what I can't get over is how replaying the game changes the scenery of each level. Sometimes it's Christmas, sometimes it's a regular forest, sometimes it's nighttime, sometimes it's daytime. Sometimes the level is normal, and sometimes the level has a stupid grey filter over it for no reason. And ever since I was a kid, I've had a soft spot for the game over screen. But was the game really that much of a haunted holiday? It is for kids after all, and it isn't meant to be creepy so much as it's meant to be... spoopy. So with that in mind, who approved this music? It's been playing for the entire video, and it's exactly as off-putting while playing the game as it is to listen to. The Super Nintendo was the same console that made this music possible. But here it's like they took out the sound chip, smashed it with a hammer, flushed it down the toilet, and then shoved it back in. Everything is so... harsh, with eerily high notes and some of the creepiest chords I've ever heard in a platformer. Every song feels slightly off, but not necessarily in a bad way. The music is the one aspect that constantly reminds me that I'm supposed to be in a dream, and sometimes not even a bad dream. The Atlantis theme borders on being beautiful at points, so congratulations on actually making a soundtrack that legitimately sounds haunted. And that's it, my thoughts on a game I've remembered since I played it over 15 years ago.
If you made it this far, go check out my other videos because they might actually be about games you've heard of before. I don't mention it often on here, but I actually have a Twitter account in the description if you want updates on my videos, or more likely me just posting stupid crap. I have stuff planned, as usual, I mean, that should be a given. Uh, so stay tuned for stuff like that. If you like my stuff, then thanks for watching my videos, and you're great, so bye!